Thank you very much for the introduction, Paul. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, with the invitation from my old friend Renato, who I've worked with for a few years now, and she's very persuasive. Because I'm going to go overseas in a day or two when she rang me, I said, I can't come. Then I thought of all the nice people I know from Queensland, like Jim, Jim Griffin up the background. And uh, it's always a, a great thrill to me to meet new people and uh, renew acquaintances. Um, really, I probably haven't got a lot to add to the previous speakers, you know, I, I uh, found it very inspirational listening to all three speakers. And uh, it made me feel I'd like to be starting general practice all over again. I've had some very rich experiences, but um, one thing that is missing is tropical medicine. I, I just would have found that fascinating, because I practice in a very cold climate. Um, and and it, it does affect the spectrum of disease, but medicine's the same everywhere. When I go overseas and sit in on practice, we've all, all got the same problems. It's really very interesting, but we're very lucky in Australia that we do have a wonderful health system. Uh, I was asking some of my registrars what should I talk about when I go up to Brisbane and they said well show you your uh, rural experience and make it as glorious as possible. But that's, that's what the students tend to like but I'm not going to do that but I'll share the rural experiences. And I said tell them about uh, how the, the textbooks come about because everyone's interested in that so I might just give you a little insight into that. But I'll just uh, give you my story because I think GP was certainly the career for me. Uh, and uh, oh, so we've got to uh, get into another system. This is what general practice is about. Let's talk about the principles of general practice, which you all know. And uh, uh, of course, it's primary care, which is first contact care. And this, is, I think, is one of the wonderful things about general practice. We see the patients first as they come in off the street. And it's a challenge. And it's a great challenge to be able to make a diagnosis and to solve the problem, particularly with, if it's a life-threatening diagnosis. So that first contact is something unique to us. Uh, then there's continuing care, which is really very special. This is where you really learn about people. Uh, and you heard uh, Danielle talk about relationships. And this is what the general practice is about. I always liked it, coming from a small country town, really enjoyed the company of people. And I played in football clubs and sporting clubs where you really got to know people. And I was fascinated by human behaviour. That's one reason I was thinking in medicine. It's, it's just such a, a privilege to be learning about people and their behaviour. And so the, the continuing care is the opportunity for that. And where do you get the best in general practice? It's really there all the time. You're learning. You just learn from your mistakes, you learn what works and what doesn't work, and that's really very important. And of course there's family care, which is another privilege, and personal care, which uh, has been very well illustrated in the previous talks. Um, the other principle is of course domiciliary care. Now, uh, Domiciliary care is something that's been neglected, but uh, certainly in country practice you don't have much choice but to undertake domiciliary care. And when I went into the city practice, I still made domiciliary care a, a very important part of my work because this is where you learn so much. You learn so much by going into the homes and seeing people in the, their environment. It's often quite different to what, you, what impression you get when they're sitting in front of you in the surgery. So you just learn a lot by going doing home visits and see there's my wife doing a home visit in the, city, in the city and there I'm in the country to a 91 year old lady living out in the bush. Uh, she, she was a shopper, she was. Then there was a snake in the house, I'd get caught. Uh, and uh, I don't think I like snakes, but I... I, I had one of my skills was killing snakes, and that's one of the things you have to do in country practice. Uh, and preventive care, that's a great privilege. And you know, I've heard on the news tonight this incredible statistic how preventive care, mainly originating in primary care, has saved 60,000 uh, 
probably a death from people getting cancer. I mean, that's really very encouraging. So, wherever else can you do well, but it's in general practice. You're at the front line. And then there's the care of refugees and there's care of the indigenous people. This is why someone's talking about the flexibility. The flexibility of our art is fantastic. There's no place like general practice to practice flexibility. Everything is flexible. Your lifestyle is flexible uh, and you can develop special skills if you want to. The World Health Organization uh, just recently you'll start the importance of primary health care. And I said that they put people first and school care is about people. And we've already heard that. And they're saying that now more than ever we need a good primary health care system. And I'll just uh, illustrate that there some of the hallmarks of general practice. I've already mentioned some of them. Uh, I'm sorry that I'm getting a different picture on the screen, but I've got this up there. But uh, I won't go through them again, but uh, the big things to me are continuity of care and first contact care. They're very important, and you can also do uh, emergency care and general practice. When I started general practice, we did all the emergencies. We called out to the roadside, and the ambulance guy stood back while we sorted it out. That's changed. It probably is a change for the better in many ways because the, these people are now so good at their work. Holistic approach to medicine, this is a great opportunity to do that. Special interest, what special interest did I have? Well, I went off and I was very interested in back pain. So I learned how to do physical therapy for the back. Uh, I learned hypnotherapy. I learned acupuncture. And I, did, I was very interested in sports medicine. So I mean, this is, you could go off and do a course. So within the context of general practice, you have all these interests. And I know my wife, who I worked with for many years, also developed her a lot, lot of interests, such as counselling and aged care and, and uh, special health for adolescents. There's so many opportunities for that. The continuity I've mentioned, I won't go into that in any detail. You can see over here that uh, when I was interested in general practice, when I was undertaking a course, I was interested in everything. I was everything fascinated skin, psychiatry, surgery, uh, obstetrics. Uh, well, I had a bias towards procedural medicine, but I was fascinated by everything, but the only choice for me is general practice. And, and I actually um, took surgical registrarship, as you can see here at the base hospital, with my wife at the time. She was focusing on, the very, I think we did something very clever without thinking about it. She focused on anaesthetics and obstetrics. I was just looking at that uh, photo and I realised that the word casualty was pointing to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> she may agree with that. <laughs> anyway, we went off into what I think, and I saw that beautiful, beautiful scenery in the tropics, we thought we practiced in the most attractive area in Australia, which was in the Great Dividing Range in the mountains. We had a, a huge town of 350 people, but we had 3,000 in the area, so you can see what a beautiful place it was. And that's uh, our first week in practice, uh, which was uh, a great privilege to be in country practice. We got to know the people, we got to like them, we got to Unfortunately, many effects of emotion involved in them, so they found the tragedies that happened rather hard to cope with. But you were in a privileged position. We undertook, uh, we had registrars coming uh, in the training program and see the guy that practiced. We didn't have an ambulance in the town. My car was the ambulance, so it was all hooked up for resuscitation, and uh, the commissary of Oxy resuscitated was on the bed of the car, and that made life a lot more interesting. Oh, there it is. I'm getting different. What sort of things are we coping with? All sorts of things. Tractor accidents, horse accidents, uh, bullet wounds. We had uh, some of the best marijuana cops in Australia hidden in, in the bush. We, it was real bush where we were. It was very rugged stuff. And uh, there's a few days to put bullets in each other quite often, so it became quite still trauma. And that was sort of largely 
general practice, even trying doctor services, so much trauma you have to, to deal with. You get called out in the middle of the night, what to to uh, road accidents, a guy who had a dislocated hip, and it was epidemic when I first went into practice, which was about 45 years ago, because it had rigid, um, uh, what am I looking for? Um, dashboards, that was rigid. And they didn't have seatbelts. So this is epidemic, and here we are, early hours in the morning, uh, reducing a uh, dislocated hip. I should have a series of photographs, but I just put one in for sake of everything. But the beauty of my practice in the country, we had our own hospital, uh, and I had my own anesthetist. You know, in so we do things very quickly, and that made life very interesting. It's a fairly unique situation, but I'm, I'll, I'm just highlighting it. The special things in the country, of course, were the uh, Vulgarians. This is mainly a presentation for students to get them interested in. And uh, there you can see the result of the straightforward one, which is easy to manage them. They get a dollar and use every really bit. We used to have this uh, problem in our area of the country. We had these little nasty leeches which would get into the eyes and my own urethra and create quite a challenge. Uh, and snake bites, of course. Uh, we had the terrible tiger snakes. And this turned out to be a brown snake bite, just a few came up from the Middle Ocean. We had spider bites. Lots of trauma. You had to know how to do your special senses. And this is a splinter in the eye. <laughs> and uh, the students were like this. <laughs> For goodness sake, prof, say the splinter in the eye. <laughs> uh, what do you do? Well, you, re you, you learn on the job as a, a soccer player. And Zach, quite a really experienced man, Zach. Uh, that's a terrific program you showed us. Anyway, what we did with this fellow, we just saw, uh, it was a pal, we saw it off close to the eye. I think the eye and the air hospital, unfortunately, um, the actual palm hadn't penetrated the globe, just went under the eye socket, so he, he was fine. He looked terrible, but that's. One thing I have learned in medicine is the amazing human has to be the body. Took me out for some of my surgery and look at me and think, oh, God. <laughs> look at them a few weeks and they were fine. So, as long as I didn't get infected. And I can never remember an infected wound from the work in the country. I mean, it was such a, uh, a good environment to work in. Um, so, I, I, after I was in practice for a while, I realised that there was all these little tricks of the trade on how to suture wounds, how to handle fractures, how to remove splinters and other foreign bodies. It was your daily work and there was no reference assignment. And I promised some people in the college that I would write a book. So I just started assembling it. And over time, um, it finished up with his practice tips. Typical things you do for children, like using their hair, providing hair's long enough to suture it, to fix up a wound in the scalp. Little, little tricks of the trade for a pulled elbow. Uh, anyway, they're all in the book. And working in a hospital where you saw your patients a couple of times a day was also great for this continuity of care. And you can see uh, the beautiful view from the hospital, a nice area we worked in. We did our own x-rays. We uh, uh, had to treat all our children with respiratory problems. But two of the most important things if you are going into rural practice and you really want to make a go of it is learn how to do uh, anaesthetics. That's where working in emergency departments is so good. That's where I learned a lot of my skills in working in emergency departments. So if you know how to give anaesthetics and you know how to do caesarean section, you can cope with a lot of problems. We developed a team and uh, we were advocates, uh, all GPs are advocates for their patients and we had the opportunity for health promotion and we developed our own team. We managed to find funding to develop a health team in a fairly remote rural community. You can see there a social worker, we had the district nurse, 
that we're working with. This is a psychiatric nurse, this is one of our psychiatric patients. We're able to cheat, visit them regularly to get their intramuscular injections of major tranquilizers for people who have psychosis. We uh, were the uh, medical office for health, we're working with the health inspector. But one of the best things I think about my experience in country practice was the opportunity to do home visits. We had some fascinating people in the area. You can see we had this very dense bush. And people came here from, came there from all over the world looking for gold. And uh, one of our problems was people disappearing down uh, digging pits. Uh, that was always a challenge. This old man you see there came from Germany. I hardly speak a word of English. The only friend he had was the dog there. And you see the incredibly uh, poor conditions in which he lived. But I, we, I would do home visits to these people regularly, uh, just to keep them out of hospital, keep them well. And he had diabetes and he was pretty sick. This old guy who lived by himself, he had this form as a child. And here he was, age 80 managing pretty well, so we used to find home visits so good. I'm just emphasising that because this is where you learn so much. The most important member of the team, in my wife, is the policeman. If ever there was a drama, and plenty of dramas, domestic violence and blacks with axes and guns threatening to shoot someone, always took the policeman along. We collected our own blood, uh, we had one patient who took blood from one day and two days later gave it back to her. One of my breast surgeries didn't go too well. Uh, indigenous health, I mean, Indigenous health is quite, is a very interesting area of health, but this photograph, of course, is more important. We have our own Indigenous patients in our, uh, in our area. Quite a, quite a area. Our family was the Rose family. Lionel Rose, one of our patients, became champion rocks of the world, and he could fight. And uh, he, they were terrific people, I found indigenous people. I used to love working with them. And uh, I often wish I had gone north to say the John Street Scholarship. And as I say, uh, we'd love to be doing this all over again. We used to, we used to run educational classes for our, uh, our community. Here there's me giving a, a talk uh, on Heart disease, I think. It's his angina. And here's my wife in my mum's health. So, a big interest of mine was patient education. Uh, whenever we had a patient in hospital or a patient with a problem, we'd write a sheet for them. And eventually, eventually, it finished up in a book, a patient education book. And uh, I just find this invaluable. Everyone who comes in the scene and now they go up with patient education material. And that's, uh, I think, it's very important. How did, I come to, how did I come to write a textbook? Well, when I was a student, I had this notebook which I carried in my short white coat. And whenever we learned something from the lecture, I'd write a skeleton of the problem, whatever it was, whether it was diabetes. That. Then you realise after a period of years, uh, you'd have information added to it. So there was opportunities to, to add to this book. And I had someone come to an interview with me recently a fellow representing the rural network in South Australia and he was intrigued by this old notebook but that eventually led to the general practice textbook it was based on notes I'd taken as a student and then as a register. The things that have come out from this of course is the uh, I'm always teaching people the importance of having flashcards little cards for every common condition and studying from that. And uh, in fact, I've just had a, uh, some emails from some uh, house doctors in, in Iran who have told me they had a brilliant idea. They, they liked the book. I had this idea that they'd like to produce flashcards. Now, I've had flashcards for about 30 years. And now, as, a, as my phone apps, flashcards. So that's probably best way to happen. Now these guys in Iran are actually going to produce the cards, which is terrific because uh, actually the cards are very good to handle. Cautionary tales, well, 
we've heard some cautionary tales uh, tonight, and uh, that's where we learned so much from cautionary tales. We've been talking cautionary tales last week, and the audience were all over it in what was my embarrassing moments. And there's plenty of those, and they said, tell us an interesting story which is not in the book. So I, I told them the one which is quite hilarious. I had a 16-year-old girl who became pregnant. Uh, Unplanned, of course, and so she needed a fair bit of support. But she decided it was going to be quiet, and eventually uh, she said she's going to keep the baby very good before we had the baby and family support. Anyway, one night I got called a house call to them. She was in hysterical, I could hear it over the phone, she was hysterical. So I raced her, goodness me, what's been going on? I think she was about 32 weeks pregnant. And I got there and things had come down. What had happened during the night? A cat had got in the bed with her and she thought she delivered the baby. Because the cat was running in around in the bed, and of course this is for Adam. It's quite a hilarious situation. But these are the things you see, which really makes life very interesting. But then you've got, you've got the, uh, the issue of being able to cancel people and adopt them through this, and that's pretty special. Now, lots of the GP. Uh, this is Peter Toon, who uh, is a brilliant guy in England who he, he wrote what he thought was a good professional person, GP, lawyer, minister and so on. And this is what he did about a GP. But of course it could be uh, it could be a doctor, it could be a specialist, but in particular for a GP, I'm sure I'm not going to go through it, but I'm sure you recognise it. Okay. Now that's a good GP there consulting. As we work together in the country for Twelve years, and that's my son. Uh, this is a post by the way. <laughs> and he's a, a, now an anaesthetist, but he's only saying recently, Dad, I wish I'd done general practice because he's a highly qualified anaesthetist and, 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 and has a qualification in pain management. He can't get the job he wants. So he's going out to Mount Eyes and Broken Hill and these places doing black ones. And uh, so, that's just a little tease to put to you that uh, a lot of the specialists are coming saturated. So it's probably a, a, a backdoor way of doing general practice, but something worth thinking about. It's a great career, it's flexible, uh, you, have, you can set aside this enormous curiosity you have about patients and your problems, and uh, it, it provides incredible flexibility for the room. That's my ideas, uh, obviously what I think makes a good GP. Uh, I'm a great believer in the importance of being observant, very astute. And all my students get drilled about the importance of watching people and working out what's going on, working out their psyche. And I say to them, can you pick the person who's autistic? Can you pick the person who has a psychosis, who's depressed? And I, I challenge them on this, I said, unless you can do this, you don't have to stop the call. So this is always a challenge of being observant, being observant for any physical characteristics. And uh, the other day someone came up and asked me what my problem was. I said, what do you mean, what's my problem? Mm -hmm. uh, apart from being vertically challenged, I said, you back. So that's I said, that's good. You know, I've got a problem with that, so I was able to tell them about my problem with that. But, I said to the student, this is terrific. You observe something, you're inquisitive, uh, you're curious, you get to the bottom of it, you've got to ask. So that's what I emphasise to them. Uh, at the last one there, having a fail safe diagnostic strategy, just had some people talking about it with it tonight. I, I think this is um, a great way of approaching a problem. Some of them coming in with a presenting problem. Uh, so there's a feeling that uh, I was responsible for developing this red flag concept and the yellow flag concept. And I think that uh, uh, this is a good way to approach it. So some of you are going to be sitting in your exams with the various colleges, the postgraduate exams. People come to me and say, what do I study? And uh, 
So what I've done, uh, I've brought out a, uh, a program called um, Diagnostic Models. And the Diagnostic Models cover about 80 common presenting problems. And we go through the key features, which the exams are all about. The key questions will be the diagnostic approach, the model, key questions to ask, key investigations, and uh, uh, key physical examination. The college has the College of General Practitioners has the right to that, and if you remember the college, you can get access to it, that soon will be released. So it's just a way of trying to discipline us to think about an approach to solving problems. Anyway, there's a wonderful quote about the general practice from Moses B. Maimon, who was a very brilliant man, who was a physician, and I'll just leave you to read that. Uh, once again, he uh, talks about relationships and being inspired by your work. He talks about keen observation and about scientific method. Uh, all the uh, key features of proficient medical practice. So, this is what general practice is all about for me. It's about relationships, caring for people, dealing with this girl, this 18-year-old uh, girl who had anorexia nervosa, terrible anorexia nervosa, you want to get to the bottom of it. Why did she have it? No one really asked it. So happened she was being sexually abused by an uncle. Uh, and my good friend Ted, 40-year-old bloke with a very plethoric face, was obviously had an alcohol problem. He denied he had an alcohol problem. So I went to the doctor, you can ask the wife, you can ask mother, uh, and I knew he had an alcohol problem, and he had all the features. Uh, and one day, the milk packer driver turned up and I did something very new. I said, how much beer do you deliver to Ted? And he says, it doesn't bother me today. He said, it doesn't bother me today, and he tried to hide. There's a fellow dying with cancer. It's a long story, I'm not going to do it. It's a matter of recognising a really sick child, and that's medicine, that's what general practice about. And it's dealing with refugees. They really have incredible problems. But it's something that's challenged to us. And that's where we can help them. And just from the shop of the funny cow turn, which I particularly like. Um, you can um, with all the education in the world but may not just it may not get the result. And I think this illustrates uh, how it how it can go wrong. Anyway, anyway, thank you for listening, but I just thought I'd share with you uh, thanks to my students who suggested the topic, something about my life as GP, why I think it is the best form of medicine. I do hope a lot of you take this up and have uh, this career is as exciting as people like Scott and myself and some of the other people here have had. Uh, it's a very special career. Thank you.